everyone. Welcome to part three of chapter seven. Last time we began our talk on thermochemistry and we looked at how to calculate the energy that was being absorbed or released when a substance changed temperature. We were using that Q equals MC delta T to do calorimetry calculations, where we were able to say that the amount of energy lost by something hot was completely gained by something cold. And so that was when we were setting those Q equals MC delta T's equal to each other. Today, we are going to focus on the energy that's being absorbed or released during a phase change. Last time, we weren't dealing with anything changing phase. We were just saying, okay, the water will heat up or cool down, or the metal will heat up or cool down, right? But this, we're going to look at how does our energy change during a phase change. And then we're going to kind of combine all of the calculations together. Okay, what if we heated up some water and then we boiled it and then continued heating up the steam? Well, how much energy would that take? So that's kind of the game plan for today. So let's go ahead and get started. So like I said, today we are going to focus on phase changes. We've talked a little bit about phase changes before, um, but now we're going to talk about them in terms of thermochemistry. So just in general, matter is going to undergo a change of state when we're converting it from one state to another at constant temperature. And this is really important here. During a phase change, the temperature actually doesn't change. So if you think about your water boiling on the stove, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So even though, you know, you keep the fire on or you keep, you know, your pot on the stove and continue heating it, the temperature of the boiling water will never go above 100 degrees Celsius. Isn't that crazy? You can try it at home. Um, but as long as it's boiling and as long as there's still water there, it will never go above 100 degrees Celsius until every single drop of water is completely converted into steam. So pretty cool. But I do want you to remember that phase changes happen at constant temperature. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at, you know, this diagram on the right. So let's say we're starting with ice. So ice we know is a solid. Okay. So when your solid absorbs some heat, then it will melt. So that's an endothermic process. Our solid will take in heat to melt and become liquid water. Okay. Whereas the opposite is true. If your liquid loses heat, then it will become ice. That's an exothermic process. Now be really careful here. A lot of times people think, okay, when it changes from a liquid to a solid, it's getting colder. And we associate feeling cold with endothermic. No, 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 no. You need to think about how that actually became a solid. The way it became a solid is we cooled it down, which means we removed energy. So if we're removing energy, that's exothermic. So in anything that's cooling down, where heat is being released, that's gonna be exothermic. So all of these that are blue, those are going to be exothermic processes. And anything that's red, that's going to be an endothermic process because it's taking in heat. Like the way we get ice to melt, we put in heat to make it melt. Same thing if we take our liquid and then we put in heat, then we can cause it to turn into steam or vapor. So that process is called vaporization. The opposite, turning steam or you know a gas into a liquid, that's called condensation. And so again, that is going to be exothermic because we're removing heat. A phase change that people don't talk a lot about is going directly from solid to gas or vice versa. And we'll talk a little bit more about this um, on a later slide, but you can actually go directly from the solid phase to the gas phase. That's called sublimation, okay? And we see that when we have you know, dry ice. So if you go and you buy solid carbon dioxide, you can get it at the grocery store, um, but if you buy solid carbon dioxide, it will go from a solid directly to the gas phase and will never turn into a liquid. Kind of cool. The opposite of that, a gas going directly to a solid, that's called deposition. And I don't actually have a good example for where you see that in nature because we really don't. If you get into higher levels of chemistry, we will use deposition as a purification scheme. 
and it's actually a really neat process. Um, but again, we don't see many examples of that out in nature. All right, let's talk more about phase changes. So when a solid is converted into a liquid, we call that melting. And that phase change you're likely pretty familiar with. If that liquid goes to a solid, then we call that freezing. Okay, and I do want you to know these phase changes. Likely you're familiar with these from our experience with water. If your liquid absorbs some energy, then we can turn it into a gas, and that's called vaporizing. You can also call it boiling. I'm fine with that too. If the gas turns back into a liquid, like I said, that's called condensing. Okay, and that's usually one that people aren't as familiar with. Your example of condensation is like if you go out to a restaurant and you say you have a glass of ice water, do you notice that the water, like there's water that kind of absorbs onto the outside of your glass? That's actually water vapor from the air that has cooled down enough to condense onto the sides of the glass. If we go directly from a solid to a gas, that's called sublimation. And like I said, our example of that is dry ice. If we go from a gas to a solid, that's called deposition. So I do want you to know all of these phase changes and be able to tell me whether these are exothermic processes or endothermic processes. Pretty much everything that's going to the left is losing energy, and these are all going to be exothermic. Anything that's going to the right is going to gain energy, and these are all going to be endothermic. All right, let's talk a little more in depth about melting and freezing. So when we have something that changes from a solid to a liquid, the temperature at which it does that is called the melting point. Um, the same temperature is actually also called the freezing point. So like for water, the melting point and the freezing point are both at zero degrees Celsius. And my apologies, that should be a capital C. Okay, um, so but these both happen at zero degrees Celsius. It's just going to depend on wh whether we're inputting energy or removing energy. So if we are inputting energy, then we call it the melting point because it will go from a solid to a liquid. That's an endothermic process. If we are removing energy, then that's an exothermic process. And so we call that the freezing point. Okay, but again, both of these for water are at zero degrees Celsius. So when we're talking about the melting point, and the freezing point, we're talking about the same temperature. So this melting and freezing point, its technical definition is the temperature at which the solid phase of, of a substance is in equilibrium with its liquid phase. Essentially what this means is that at the melting point or at the freezing point, both the solid and the liquid phase will be present, okay? And again, during this time, the temperature is going to remain constant. So let's take like some ice. So ice, you know, we usually keep it fairly cold. Usually it's below zero degrees Celsius to make sure it's all in the solid phase. But let's say we started to heat it up and we'll heat it up. And when the temperature of that ice reaches zero, then it will start to melt. And that temperature will stay at zero until every single piece of ice is completely melted. Okay, so during that time, while it's melting, both the solid and the liquid phase will be present because it's undergoing a phase change. So during that phase change, the temperature will remain constant. Okay, the same thing is true if we have a liquid. Let's say our liquid is at room temperature, some water, and it's about 20 degrees Celsius. All right, well, if we put our water in the freezer and we cool down our water, when it hits zero, then it will stay at zero until every single water molecule turns into the solid phase. Once all of that liquid water turns completely solid, then the temperature can dip below zero. But until it's all frozen, it will stay at zero. So during this phase change, when both solids are present, or sorry, when both phases are present, the temperature remains constant and it will stay at that freezing point or at that melting point. So the reason that temperature stays constant is because the energy that we are putting in or the energy that we are removing 
is being used to change the phase. Normally, when we input energy, let's say we take some water and we're going to heat up our water. Normally, that energy that we are inputting is used to make the molecules move faster and faster and faster. Remember, temperature is a measure of how fast our molecules are moving. So if we're inputting energy and the molecules are moving faster, that's what causes the temperature to increase. Okay, so during a phase change though, that energy that we are putting into our sample, instead of it being used to move the molecules faster and faster and faster, it's actually being used to break the intermolecular attractions. Remember, we were talking about that before. Solids have very strong intermolecular forces. They're kind of being locked into the solid phase because of those strong attractions. So as we input energy at the melting point, then that, that energy is being used to break the attraction between the molecules and turn it from the solid phase into the liquid phase. And then once all of it is melted, then the molecules can start moving faster and faster and faster again because now they're in the liquid phase. Okay, so when I ask you, um, and this is usually a pretty good test question, just as like a hint, hint, um, that added energy, like what's it doing during the phase change? It's being used to break the intermolecular attractions. So the energy that's required to melt a solid is called the heat of fusion. Okay, we're going to learn two different kind of heats of today. So the heat of fusion is the one that's being associated with melting and freezing. Okay, usually our heats of fusion or our heats of anything are given as molar quantities, which means it's going to tell you the amount of energy you need to put in per mole of a substance. So like our molar heat of fusion is abbreviated delta H fuse. Okay. And it's the amount of energy in kilojoules per mole required to melt one mole of a substance. Okay, So if you look, here's a bunch of different substances here. And there's their melting points. You'll notice the ones with stronger intermolecular forces have a higher melting point. Whereas the ones with weak intermolecular forces, like argon, right, is a noble gas. And only has dispersion forces, which is why it has such a low melting point. Okay, and then our heats of fusion here on the right hand side, those are always given in kilojoules per mole. So when we use them, we're going to have to calculate how many moles of our substance we have in order to use this formula. Okay, here's our formula. So in the last lecture, we were using Q equals MC delta T to calculate our energy. That is going to be used when it's not a phase change. Okay. When it's a phase change, like we're talking about right now, we are going to use Q equals mole delta H. And in particular, in this one, we're going to use Q equals mole delta H fusion because this is the one associated with melting and freezing. So let's try this out. This says the heat of fusion for water is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. And I do want to let you know, you're never going to have to memorize that number. I will always give it to you. It is one of those things that if you do enough practice problems, you may accidentally memorize it, but you definitely don't have to. So this says calculate the amount of heat needed to melt 25.0 grams of water. Okay, so we have our constant here, 6.01 kilojoules per mole. Do you see the fact that this says mole? That means we're going to need to convert our grams into moles before we can use that formula, okay? So the other reason you're going to know that you need to convert it into moles is because this is a phase change. In all of our phase change calculations, we are going to use that Q equals mole delta H. Okay, That will be our energy for phase changes. So anytime you have a phase change, you're going to need to turn grams into moles. So here's our 25 grams of water. So we'll convert it to moles just like we've done before. The way we convert from grams to moles is we'll use the molar mass. So our molar mass of water is 18.02 grams of water, and that will be equivalent to one mole of water. So we make sure our units cancel, and then we'll get our moles of water. So once we've found moles of water, we can use our new formula for calculating the heat released during a phase change. So that's Q equals mole delta H. Okay, so here's our moles that we just calculated, and then here is our delta H value. You'll notice I just put delta H instead of delta H fuse. That's because this is a general equation. 
we will learn a couple different types of delta H's. So rather than learn different equations, I'm just going to remember, okay, I need to use this delta H value because it's for melting and freezing. Okay. Um, so again, there's our moles, there's our delta H value, we'll multiply them together, and we'll get our answer. Notice here that this Q comes out in kilojoules, not joules. When we were doing Q equals MC delta T, our unit for that always came out in joules. But here, because our constant is in kilojoules per mole, that means that this answer comes out in kilojoules. Okay, so make sure your units are correct. All right, let's now talk about vaporization and condensation. Okay, so um, vaporization and condensation are again opposites, just like melting and freezing. Okay, so if we take our liquid and we input heat, then we will vaporize it into the gas phase. If we take our gas and remove heat, we will condense it back into liquid phase. Okay, um, again, these two things happen at the same temperature. So for water, both of these happen at 100 degrees Celsius. So in order to know whether it's the, you know, the vaporization point or the condensation point, um, you just need to know, are we putting in heat or are we removing heat, right? And that's pretty much it. But again, these happen at the same temperature. They are both going to happen for water at 100 degrees Celsius. So our technical definition for the boiling or condensing point is the temperature at which the liquid phase is in equilibrium with the gas phase. So again, this is kind of the same terminology that we were using to think about going from solid to liquid or liquid to solid. Okay, During this phase change, the temperature will remain constant. And again, for water, it will remain at 100 degrees Celsius during this entire process. So like I mentioned earlier, when we boil our water on the stove or in lab, that water is going to stay at 100 degrees Celsius until every single drop of water is completely converted into the gas phase, okay? It cannot increase in temperature until that happens, okay? But if both phases are present, like when it boils, right, we have liquid and we have gas kind of bubbles happening. So that's showing us both phases are present. And while both phases are present, that temperature remains constant. So again, this energy that we're putting in Instead of being used to make the molecules move faster, this energy is being used to break the intermolecular attractions between the liquid particles and send them into the gas phase. Okay, that is that actually requires a lot of energy. It requires more energy to boil something than it does to melt something. Because when we boil something, when we change it from a liquid to a gas, we have to completely break all of the intermolecular forces and release that particle completely. That requires a ton of energy. Um, so this um, energy that we need to put in at this point is going to be very, very high. But again, the energy that we're adding here is not being used to make the molecules move faster. It's being used to break intermolecular forces during phase changes. So our energy that we use at that melting and condensing point is called the heat of vaporization. So when it's dealing with melting and freezing, that's the heat of fusion. But when we're talking about boiling and condensing, that's the heat of vaporization. But again, these heats of vaporization are also given as molar quantities. So that means it's going to be kilojoules per mole of our substance. Okay, our delta H value is um, going to be de delta H vape now to be vaporization, but again, kilojoules per mole. So you'll see here the substances that have lower intermolecular forces, like argon, are going to have very low boiling points, whereas water can hydrogen bond, therefore it has a much higher boiling point. You'll also see that reflected in our delta H vape. It takes a ton of energy to vaporize water because it has really strong intermolecular attractions, which are keeping it in the liquid phase. Okay, so here is our formula, Q equals mole delta H vape. This is the exact same thing as the last formula, except we're using a different delta H value. So that's why you'll hear me just say, you know, usually I'll just write Q equals mole delta H, and then I'll remember which delta H value I need to use. If it's melting and freezing, 
that'll be delta H fuse, F-U-S. And if it's boiling and condensing, then it will be delta H vape. All right, let's try this one out. This is calculate the heat of vaporization for water. Oh, sorry. The heat of vaporization for water is 40.79 kilojoules per mole. Calculate the amount of heat needed to vaporize 25 grams of water. So again, we'll notice this is a phase change. Anytime we're doing a phase change, we need to have our amount of substance in moles so we can use Q equals mole delta H. So we'll take our 25 grams of water and we'll convert it to moles using the molar mass of water. It will be helpful for you to memorize the molar mass of water. You don't have to, obviously, um, but it would be helpful if you did because we are going to do a lot of our calculations with water. All right, so once we convert our grams to moles, now we can use our formula that Q equals mole delta H. So we'll take our number of moles, we'll multiply it by our delta H value, and you'll notice this one is much bigger than the one for melting and freezing, and we'll get our amount of energy. So again, this amount of energy is coming out in kilojoules because we have kilojoules in our constant here. All right, our last uh, kind of types of phase change are sublimation and deposition. We are not going to do any calculations associated with these. I just want you to know what they are. So sublimation is going from a solid phase to a vapor phase, okay, or the gas phase. If you've never done this before, you know, go out to the grocery store and buy some dry ice. It's really cool, just make sure to handle it with caution because it can, it gets really, really cold and can actually burn your hands because it's so cold. Um, so make sure you, you know, wrap your hands in towels or whatever you need to do um, to make yourself safe. But it is really neat to see deposition happen. It goes directly from the solid phase to the gas phase without ever turning into a liquid. Um, again, the reverse of that is called deposition. Uh, and we don't see deposition a lot, um, but you will see it if you go on and take organic chemistry because we use it to purify our substances. So sublimation is endothermic because that solid has to absorb energy to turn into the gas phase. And then deposition is exothermic because we are removing energy from our gas in order to turn it back into a solid. Alrighty, let's get some practice. So go ahead and complete problems number 25 to 29 on the chapter seven lecture worksheet. Once you're done, come back and we'll keep going. All right, our last topic for chapter seven is on the heating curve of water, okay? Um, so the heating curve of water shows us what happens if we take some very, very cold water, so this starts at negative 25 degrees Celsius, and we take it through all of the phase changes of water. So at negative 25, that's below zero, so it would start out as ice. So here this graph is showing, okay, we're gonna warm up our ice, and then we're gonna melt it, and then we're going to heat up our water, and then we're gonna boil it, and then we're going to heat up our steam. Okay, so in the heating curve of water, there's always five different sections. The first, we're going to start as ice and then we're going to warm up our ice. Then we're going to melt our ice into a liquid. Then we are gonna warm up our liquid to the boiling point, And then we're going to boil it into steam and then heat up our steam, okay? So this is showing as I add energy, what happens to my ice, okay? The change in temperature is always going to be here. Um, and then the heat added will be down on the bottom. A couple key points. Do you notice that there are two places where our graph is flat? Our graph is flat at zero degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. Remember, this is because the temperature does not change during a phase change. So at zero degrees Celsius, this temperature remains flat. It remains constant until every single bit of ice is completely melted. The same thing is happening at 100 degrees Celsius. That temperature is flat, right? And the reason for that is that it will stay at 100 degrees Celsius until every single bit of water has completely turned into steam, okay? So I like to think of it as my sloped lines like this. So you'll see that that's one, three, and five. My sloped lines are phases. Okay, so by phases, I mean solid, 
liquid, or gas. Okay, so down here at one, that's a solid. Here at three, that's a liquid. And then up at five, that's a gas. So our sloped lines are always going to be phases. Our flat lines in this graph are going to be phase changes. And by phase changes, I mean melting or freezing, right? Because those happen at the same temperature. Or boiling or condensing because those happen at the same temperature. Okay, so again, we're going to have sloped lines at our phases and flat lines at our phase changes. So I want you to be able to draw this heating curve of water. Um, and again, our flat portions are going to happen at zero and 100. Those are the melting and boiling points of water. So I want you to be able to roughly sketch this and tell me which portions of the graph correspond to solid, liquid, and gas, and which portions of the graph correspond to phase changes and what those phase changes are. Okay, so in this heating and cooling curve, we will see all of the changes of state that are happening, right? We're going to have that solid, we're going to warm up the solid, then we're going to melt it, then we're going to heat up the liquid, then we're going to boil it, then we're going to turn it into a gas. These heating curves are essentially a graph, okay? I'm not going to make you associate numbers with this heat added on the bottom, we're going to save that adventure for Chem 1, but I do want you to be able to do the temperatures on the left-hand side, on that y-axis, and we'll get some practice with that today. Okay, The heating curves are going to illustrate a change of state, again, with a horizontal line. So that's where I was saying that these, you know, this horizontal line, those are for phase changes, and a change in temperature as a sloped line, okay, and those will represent our phases. So solid, liquid, and gas. So again, here's another heating curve for water. So again, it doesn't matter what temperature we start at as long as it's cold and it's below zero. So that's going to tell us that we're starting with ice. We're starting with a solid here. And then you see this flat line. The flat line is always going to happen at zero because that is the melting point of water. So that is where the temperature, right, that increase in temperature, or the increase in energy, my apologies, is being used to break the intermolecular forces rather than increase the temperature, okay? Then, after all of it is melted, the temperature can rise again. And so that's where we see this, because all of that is liquid water. But once that liquid water hits 100 degrees Celsius, then it will start to boil. And that temperature will stay at 100 degrees Celsius until all of our water has boiled. Once all of the liquid water is gone and it's all turned into steam, now we can continue heating up our steam, okay? So again, you'll have three sections that are sloped that represent our phases. So this is solid, liquid, and gas, okay? Those are the sloped lines. The flat lines are always going to be our phase changes. So here, this one is melting, and this one up here is boiling. And at those phase changes, remember, there are two phases that are present during a phase change. So if it's melting, we have both solid and liquid present. If it's boiling, we have both liquid and gas present. Okay. So again, I'm not going to make you do anything with the x-axis. All I want you to know is that as the x-axis goes to the right, we're increasing the amount of heat but I do want you to be able to assign numbers to the, to the y-axis. The flat lines will happen at zero and 100 because those are the melting and boiling points for water. All right, so let's go ahead and see how to do the calculations associated with these heating curves. This says calculate the energy needed to convert 25 grams of ice at zero degrees Celsius to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. And it, I gave you some constants there. Okay, the first thing you are always going to do is draw the graph. Super important. Okay, do you see that we are changing phases? We have ice and then we're going to steam. Okay, this is going to tell you 
that you need to draw a graph. Anytime you are changing phases of matter, you're going to need to draw a graph to figure out how many calculations you need to do. Okay, so our first thing that we're going to do is we're going to draw a graph. And by drawing a graph, I mean draw a little coordinate. Okay, you have an x-axis and a y-axis. I put always the coldest temperature that I'm given at the bottom. That's zero degrees Celsius here. Okay, and then I'm going to put the hottest temperature that I've given at the top. So for this example, that's 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so again, I'm just going to draw an x and y axis. I'm going to put the coldest one at the bottom and the hottest one at the top. So this says we're starting with ice at 0 degrees Celsius and converting it to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. All right, so let's think about this. So we have, we're starting here, right? We're always going to start there. And we have ice at zero degrees Celsius. So we're putting in heat to go from ice to steam, right? So the first thing, if we input energy that our ice will do, our ice is going to melt. It's already right at the melting point. So we put in a little more energy, that's going to cause our ice to melt. So this graph is actually gonna start off being flat along the bottom. Hopefully you can see that it's flat along the bottom because what we're doing is we're turning our ice into liquid water. Okay, so the first thing we are going to do is we are going to melt our ice. Once all of the ice is melted, then the temperature can start to rise and our temperature will start to rise until it hits 100 degrees Celsius. And once it hits 100 degrees Celsius, then it will start to boil. And once all of it is boiled, then it will be converted to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so again, we're going to melt our ice. We're going to heat up our liquid water. And then we're going to boil our liquid water into steam. Okay, so this is a three-step process. So when we're drawing these heating curves, we will not be doing all five steps all of the time, right? Like I was drawing before. Essentially, we need to figure out what snapshot of that heating curve we need to do our calculations. So that's what I've done here. So that's why I just started at the bottom at zero and went to 100 at the top because that's the portion of the heating curve that I need for this problem. So that's how I knew to start with, you know, our ice at zero degrees Celsius. The first thing it had to do was to melt because that's all it can do at zero degrees Celsius because it can't be ice anymore because zero is the melting point. Once all of that ice melts into liquid water, then we can start to increase the temperature again. And then once it hits 100, we'll boil it. I would also keep in mind, this will help you out, that at zero and at 100, you're pretty much always going to have a flat line because those are the melting and boiling points of water. So at zero here and at 100 here, we're having flat lines and it'll be a sloped line in between. All right, so I said it was a three-step process. So our three, process, our three steps are, we're going to melt the ice. So that's going to be Q equals mole delta H because that's a phase change. Then we are going to warm up our liquid water and that'll be Q equals MC delta T because we're not undergoing a phase change in that step. The third step will be to evaporate our water or boil it. And again, that's a phase change, so we'll use Q equals mole delta H. Then to figure out the total energy, we're gonna add up the Q values from each one of these three steps, and that will give us the amount of energy needed to do this entire conversion here. Okay, so these types of problems are a bit long, but if you do enough practice problems, then they'll just be a bit long and they won't be too, too hard. All right, let's try this out. So the first thing we were doing, oh here, I'm gonna redraw our graph. So this was our graph. We said we had zero degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. And the first thing we needed to do was melt our ice. That'll be step one. Then we're going to heat up our water to 100 and then melt, or then boil it, my apologies, into steam. So this will be one, two, three. Anywhere we have a flat line, remember, that's going to be a phase change and at phase changes, we are going to use Q equals mole delta H. 
anywhere we have a sloped line, that's going to be a phase. And since no uh, changes of state are happening, that's going to be Q equals MC delta T. So we're going to use both of these two equations in these calculations. You just need to know, are you doing a phase change or is it just a phase? So for the first step, it's flat. So that represents a phase change. So we're going to use Q equals mole delta H. So the first thing we need to do is turn our grams into moles using the molar mass because we need to have moles of our substance. I apologize, I wrote just all over that. <laughs> this is 1.39 moles of water. So once we get our moles, we can use Q equals mole delta H to figure out our amount of energy that we need in order to do that phase change, in order to melt all of our ice. So that's here. Just remember that this comes out in kilojoules. That's gonna be really important. All right, our next step, after we've melted all of our ice, now we can start to warm our water. When we warm our water, we're not doing a phase change. So we're just gonna use Q equals MC delta T because that's the one that we'll use when we're not changing phase. So here, our mass of our water, we just use the mass just like normal. We have 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Remember, that's the specific heat of water. And then our change in temperature. So um, our change in temperature is always going to be final minus initial. So we have 100 minus zero. That'll give us 100 degrees Celsius as our temperature change. So if we do this Q equals MC delta T, this is what we'll get. But remember, this comes out in joules. Okay. So do you remember this one up here? This came out in kilojoules, but this is coming out in joules. In order to be able to add these all together at the end, we need to make sure that these are all in the same units. So usually what I'll do is I'll take our joules, divide by a thousand, and that will give me kilojoules, which makes it much easier to add these all together. So now we have our answer from step one, our answer from step two. So now we can do step three. Our last step of this problem is to now boil our water, okay, or evaporate it. Again, this is going to be a phase change, so we're going to use Q equals mole delta H. So here's our converting our grams to moles again, and you don't have to do this step again um, because you already converted it to moles. I'm just showing it here um, to kind of reinforce that. But if you already calculated moles earlier in the problem, don't feel like you need to do it again just to show me that you can. You can just use that mole value in this part. So now, because this is a phase change, we'll use Q equals mole delta H. So you'll notice though that these have two different delta H values. Up here, this delta H was delta H fuse because this is the one that was happening at zero degrees Celsius. This one is delta H vape because this is the one that's happening at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so make sure you're using the correct delta H values. So Q equals mole delta H, and then we'll get the amount of energy needed for that step. So now we have our amount of energy needed to do each step of this process. In order to answer this question though, we need to add them all up. So we'll add together these three numbers and we'll get our total answer. Don't forget to do this last bit when you add them all up. Sometimes people will do, okay, I got my answer for part one, two, and three, and I'm done. Um, and you're not because you haven't actually answered the question up at the top of the page. So make sure to add them all together at the end. And remember, in order to add them all together, they all need to be in the same units. A lot of times I'll tell you calculate the energy in kilojoules or in joules, but if I don't tell you which one to do, you can do it in either. Just make sure your units match. All right, let's do another one. So this problem says, how many joules of energy are needed to change 10 grams of water at 10 degrees Celsius to steam at 120 degrees Celsius? All right, looking at this, do you see that we have liquid water and we have steam? That means at some point, this substance underwent a phase change. So that's going to tell us that we need to draw a graph. So let's draw it. Again, when I do these graphs, I put the coldest temperature at the bottom and the hottest temperature at the hot at the top. So this will be 10.0 degrees Celsius at the bottom and 120.0 degrees Celsius at the top. 
Then we need to think about, okay, are there any other important temperatures that happen in this range? And the answer is yes. One important temperature for water is 100 degrees Celsius, and that happens in this range. Okay, you'll notice I didn't include zero degrees Celsius in my graph. Although it's important for water, it doesn't fall in this snapshot that we're talking about in this problem. This problem is just talking about from 10 degrees Celsius to 120 degrees Celsius. So the boiling point of water falls in that range, but the melting point doesn't. So that's why it's not on our graph. All right, so we are going to heat up our water and eventually change it into steam. So right now at 10 degrees Celsius, we have liquid water. And that liquid water will stay liquid until it hits 100 degrees Celsius. At 100 degrees Celsius, that water will start to boil. And remember, while it's boiling, that um, graph stays flat because the temperature stays constant. After all of the water has completely boiled and turned into steam, then the temperature continues to rise to 120 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's how I draw my graphs. I think about what's the temperature at the bottom, what's the temperature at the top, are there any interesting temperatures that happen in between, like 0 and 100? And then when I put that 100 there, I know there's going to be a flat line at 100 because that will be a phase change. All of the other ones will be phases, so they will be sloped lines. Okay, so again, we're going to have three distinct portions to this graph. So we're going to do three calculations and then add them all together to get our answer. So I'll draw this again. Here's our graph. So our coldest temperature was 10 degrees Celsius. Our hottest temperature was 120 degrees Celsius. And we said our interesting temperature that happens in the middle is 100. It's going to be flat at 100 degrees Celsius because that's a phase change. And in all other portions of our graph, it's going to be sloped because it'll be phases. All right. So in this first one, do you see that that's a sloped line, number one? So since it's a slope line, that represents a phase. Therefore, we are going to use Q equals MC delta T. So we have our mass is 25 degrees Celsius. We have our specific heat of water, and then we have our temperature change. So our temperature change here is always final minus initial. So we have 100 minus 10, okay? You'll notice I used 100 minus 10 because we're just looking at the temperature change for this section of the graph. So it's not the overall hottest temperature minus the overall coldest temperature. It's just the hottest and coldest temperatures for that section. Okay, so 100 minus 10 degrees Celsius gets us a change of 90 degrees Celsius here. And then we'll get our Q value. I know you can't see the problem anymore, but this problem asked us to have, a, have our heat in joules. So we're going to go ahead and leave this one in joules for this problem. All right, the next step is a flat line. That is going to be a phase change, okay? And whenever we have a phase change, that's going to be Q equals mole delta H. So we need to turn our grams of water into moles of water using the molar mass. Once we have our moles of water, you, we can use mold, Q equals mole delta H to figure out the energy needed to turn our liquid water into steam, okay? Just make sure that you're using the right delta H value. Because this is the boiling point, we are going to use delta H vape, okay? That will get us 56.7 kilojoules because our unit is kilojoules in our constant. But this problem wants all of our answers in joules, so we're going to multiply this by 1,000 to turn kilojoules into joules. All right, our last step is step three. Do you see we have a sloped line again? That means this is a phase. So we're going to use Q equals MC delta T. So again, our mass stays the same, but you'll notice there's a different C value. We haven't come across this yet. There's a different specific heat for solid water, liquid water, and gaseous water. Okay, so make sure you're using the right C value. I will give you all of them. You don't need to memorize them at all. Like I said, you might accidentally memorize the one for liquid water because you'll use it so much. Um, but the other ones you definitely don't need to memorize, and I will always give them to you. So if we went back and looked at the previous slide, I actually gave you this value, okay? So, so we have our mass, our C value, this is the C value for steam, and then our change in temperature. So again, it's the hottest minus the coldest of that section. 
okay? So this is our section here. So it's just 120 minus 100. So that's gonna give us a temperature change of 20 degrees Celsius. All right, so then when we multiply all that out, we'll get our Q value. And again, remember that we need to add all of these together, all of our, you know, part one, part two, and part three to get our answer. And there you are. So all of these that we've drawn thus far are called heating curves because you'll see over time, right, we were inputting energy and the temperature was going up. Well, we can also draw cooling curves, okay? And instead, over time, the temperature is going down, okay? So the, a lot of this is still the same though. We'll still have the same phases of matter. We'll have steam, which is a gas. We'll have liquid water and then frozen water, which we call ice, okay? And then this, instead of being the boiling point, now it's the condensing point. And instead of this being the melting point, now it's the freezing point. So the only things that are different if we're drawing a cooling curve versus a heating curve, a cooling curve, the shape of our graph will be going down, but it's still gonna have five sections. One, two, three, four, five. It's still gonna have two flat lines at 100 and zero degrees Celsius because those are still where the phase changes happen. The only thing that's really different is the way we name the phase changes. Instead of being boiling, this is condensing, and instead of melting, it's freezing. Otherwise, the cooling curves are pretty much the same as heating curves, we just kind of draw them in reverse. Alrighty, let's get some practice on these by completing problems number 30 to 35 on the chapter seven lecture worksheet. And this actually wraps up chapter seven. We covered a lot of ground in chapter seven. We started off by looking at how our intermolecular forces impact the type of solids that can be formed, as well as the physical properties of our substance, like melting and boiling point, and vapor pressure, and viscosity, and a lot of other things. And then we started looking at thermochemistry, this idea that the amount of energy released and absorbed in chemical reactions um, impacts our study of it, and we can measure the amount of energy that's being absorbed and by released by monitoring the temperature change. And we were able to do calorimetry calculations, which I think is pretty cool. All of the amount of energy that's being lost by one substance is being gained by another. Today though, the focus was on phase changes and how we can calculate the energy associated with a phase change. And then we learned how to calculate the energy for a heating curve of water, where we heat up water turn it into a gas and then continue heating it or something like that, right? We're incorporating both that Q equals MC delta T with the Q equals mole delta H. So we've covered a lot of ground in chapter seven. Make sure to do all of these lecture worksheet problems so that you're getting a lot of practice on the types of problems you'll see on quizzes and tests. And then my recommendation, honestly, is to print it out again and do the whole thing over. Make sure you get a ton of practice so you can do these problems in your sleep. As always though, if you get stuck, please reach out to me for help. I'm more than happy to walk you through it and help you out in any way that I can. Otherwise, keep working hard and I'll talk to you guys next time.